everybody, and welcome to this week's installment of Washington Post Story Mode, or WAPOST DOMO for short. <laughs> Gonna make it a thing if I just keep saying it. Um, today, well, I always do this. Uh, <laughs> I am Washington Post video games reporter Nathan Grayson, and today we are joined by a couple of very esteemed guests um, to talk about Activision Blizzard unionization efforts. Um, so to begin the introductions, I'm going to start with um, my my eternal co-host, Shannon Liao, um, who hey. is also a video game <laughs> reporter at the Washington Post. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Um, glad to be here. I've uh, been writing about this all week and exciting to talk about this some more. And then we are also joined by Wilma Lieber Liebman. Liebman. Sorry, I'm going to I'm going to butcher everyone's last name because that's what I always do. Um who is the, I, I, you served as the chairman of the NLRB under Obama, which is uh, a huge thing to have done. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here. Mm -hmm. And then we are also joined by Risa Leibowitz of Cornell. Um, welcome. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. in the School of Industrial and Labor Relations at Cornell. Seems relevant to everything that's going on right now. It is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, for those who are just joining this kind of larger uh, conversation, or for those who may not have followed what has happened up till now, basically, um, as of last week, a portion of Activision Blizzard, uh, Raven, announced intention to unionize and set a deadline of earlier this week um, before they would file their petition to do so. And um, Activision Blizzard did not give them a response at the time, so they, as far as we know, filed their petition. Um, and then, but Activision Blizzard did do some, uh, they they made some pretty specific maneuvers in terms of seemingly responding, even if they didn't use words to do so. One of those things is that they um, had some meetings with people who are, with QA, which is the department planning to unionize, basically where they were like, we're going to kind of put you in with other departments. Um, and then the other thing that they did is they basically said, hey, it would be good if the entire studio, not just this unit, voted on unionization. Um, so to begin, question to both of you, especially that last part where they basically reframed it from saying, okay, only the QA department is going to be in the union and therefore theoretically voting on it. And then Activision Blizzard saying like, actually, Let's have everybody in this 300 person studio vote on this. Like, is that something they can do? Are they are they allowed to set the terms of the unionization vote in that way? So who do you want first? <laughs> um, <laughs> go ahead. Let's go with you. Yeah. OK, so um, it, it, they they can do it in the sense that they are entitled to take a position on what would be considered the appropriate bargaining unit, which is the term that labor law uses for determining the scope of a bargaining unit that a union will represent. The employer is entitled to take a position, uh, and it is certainly a common maneuver when a union seeks to represent a small, discrete group of employees. It is, it is common for the employer to come back and say, no, we think it should be every employee employed here uh, with presumably their understanding that the group that they have been asked to, rep to recognize are all in favor of the union. But if they add in dozens more or hundreds more, that the union's strength may be diluted because the union probably would have requested recognition for the whole group if they actually had majority support in the larger group. So that is a, a common tactic. What what raises questions, I think, in, in what happened here is that the organizing activity has been going on for some time. Uh, um, presumably Raven and Activision know this organizing activity has been going on for some time. And if in just the last week they made moves to change the organization so that the the QA, the quality assurance employees who seek to organize, are dispersed amongst all their other different departments. Presumably, I think, 
with the intent that the company would have to come back and say, well, they're not a discrete unit. They have a, they share a community of interest. Again, that's a labor law term with all these other people that they're working dispersed amongst. And so it would not be appropriate for the NLRB to say that this smaller discrete quality assurance unit is the appropriate bargaining unit. And I think what's questionable is they're doing so at, after knowing with full knowledge that the organizing attempt is going on uh, and, and in an, ob it seems to me, pretty obvious attempt to try to dilute the union strength um, by then saying, no, it has to be a larger bargaining unit. It's conceivable that that change of organization done at that timing too would in and of itself be unlawful. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, like, at this point, kind of given, because you're talking about, you know, the appearance of things. And yeah, I guess, like, on one side, we have the way that the that the unit seems to be being, if not split up, then at least, like, kind of, you know, made to potentially work in different departments or no longer be just, like, a singular unit. And then on the other side of things, we have Activision Blizzard arguing in favor of a vote across the entire studio as opposed to just within that unit. And so these things definitely look a certain way, but when it, when it comes down to it, does Activision Blizzard have legs to stand on and saying, no, no, this is actually not us trying to, you know, break up this unit or this attempted union. This is just, you know, standard operating procedure or whatever. Is there a way they could convincingly make that case? Well, there, I think there are two separate questions here, although they're mm -hmm. related. One is, um, just putting aside the timing of their having done this, whether presented with a petition for for uh, representation, whether they could convincingly argue that the appropriate bargaining unit has to be larger than the, just this discrete group of employees, um, and that it has to be larger in part because they don't work in their own discrete department, they're spread all over the larger unit. And so you can't really separate them out from the people they work amongst. So that's one argument. And that's, you know, I, I'm not sure how that turns out. I, I, I can tell you that there have been uh, cases in the past involving quality assurance employees and manufacturing facilities where the law has been that you have to organize the overall production and maintenance unit. You can't you can't separate out the smaller quality assurance workers. So that has come up in the past. Uh, there was one case back in the 90s where the NLRB said it was op appropriate, but the Court of Appeals disagreed with the NLRB. So that's an issue separate and apart from the timing of their doing this, which could be an unfair labor practice, which, which I would say they they would probably lose on that one. I think that the timing is such um, that there is a strong inference that it was done to try to uh, kill the organizational effort. So mm -hmm. they are potentially separate issues, although tied up together at, at this point. Um, and you know, just to go back to the manufacturing analogy, I mean, I, I'm aware of a case that inv that happened maybe 12 years ago, 10 years ago, uh, involving the effort of some a, a unit of mechanics who work for the Volkswagen manufacturing plant in Tennessee. And this, just a unit of mechanics wanted to organize 150 some. And Volkswagen said, no, it has to be the whole 1,500, 2,000 production and maintenance unit because these mechanics don't work in their own discrete department. They're all they're placed all over. That case was never fin uh, finally decided, but that's the kind of legal argument that you, that I think we can expect to see here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just really quickly on the timing of this. Um, so basically Raven Software Management did not respond to the unionization request directly yet on Monday when they pulled uh, the studio, uh, you know, the entire studio into a meeting and discussed for five minutes that they would uh, include the quality assurance testers into different departments across the studio. That was the first time they had uh, called the company-wide meeting since uh, that request for a, a union had been uh, had been uh, sent uh, via a letter to management. 
And in that five minute meeting, uh, management did not mention any union at all. So that was why that timing seemed to have come right after his request for a union. Um, on the other hand, when I immediately talked to my like Raven sources, they didn't see the connection right away because for months management had been saying that they were going to reorganize uh, quality assurance anyway. So this was something that was coming. But like as I talked to you, Wilma, the other day, just um, the unionization efforts have been going on for months um, ever since like the July 20th uh, lawsuit from California State. So uh, you know you could say that the reorganization was coming on for months. The the unionization efforts were going for months. So the timing is still maybe suspicious. Yeah, well, that would be the issue. What what was the timing? It a, a common defense in the cases like this is the employers say, well, we had it planned well before we had any knowledge of the organizing effort, and so that that would be a factual question. But my understanding is this this activity, even if not formally the, with this CWA union, that that's been going on for months, and I think they've had strikes. The, obviously, the employer knew about the strikes, so um, I think it is seems likely that they'll be on kind of shaky grounds on the timing argument. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, this is also interesting, I think, because on one hand, you definitely like there in the games industry, there's precedent in both directions. On one hand, um, a lot of game studios definitely keep their QA kind of sequestered off from the rest of the studio. They usually they often hire them as independent contractors. Um, it is not uncommon for them to work on different floors of a studio or even in different buildings. Um, but then on the other hand, it's also not uncommon to pair them off with different departments because then they have like department level expertise. And so what will often happen is that you will have some members of a QA team paired off of the department. And those people will be responsible for relaying information back to the broader, broader like QA unit. So they'll be like, here's what's happening over here. Here's what we need to work on in this in this area. So, I mean, there's kind of like, I, I think that Activision could definitely say like, yeah, we're just doing a thing that's industry standard after having done something else that was industry standard for a while. But you, it, it sounds like it still goes back to timing and the way that it might be considered by kind of the NLRB and other entities. You know, um, actually, I think what's what's really interesting about this situation is, you know, like in all cases, it's what's happening on the ground mm -hmm. and what you see and then what gets argued. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, the company is going to argue, well, we're just acting the way we would normally act. Mm -hmm. If there's no union there, we were going to reorganize anyway. Um, there are always issues that we're dealing with um, in business, and they just happen to coincide here with the union campaign. But it's one of those things where you look at it, and there's, as, as Wilma was saying, the timing is so suspicious. And, um, if, and if you look at industry standards, if it's common for QA employees to work separately, even though sometimes they work with departments, but it's common for them to work separately. And that's what was happening here mm -hmm. at uh, Raven. And then the timing just happens to coincide with the union campaign, with the momentum that the union campaign is getting, uh, with an anti-union email that the company sent out. You know, it really looks very much like this was quite a conscious effort of the company to both dilute the power of the employees and set up an argument for saying that the QA employees don't have a sufficient community of interest apart from other employees, and also to retaliate mm -hmm. against the, uh, the QA employees for engaging in this kind of collective, collective effort. But the question what if it gets to the NLRB with regard to the question about what is the appropriate bargaining unit? Can it be this separate, uh, discrete group of QA employees? I think will be just whether all of that evidence of the timing and and the other anti-union um, sort of responses by the company, how much that evidence will be considered relevant to whether a community of interest um, exists sufficiently for just these QA employees to um, to be viewed as a separate unit that can vote on its own for an election. 
you know, I don't know what Wilma had to say. My guess is that the actions to separate the employees into uh, separate departments will be certainly relevant to that conclusion. I'm not sure if some of the other anti-union kinds of uh, actions would be, you know, considered in that question of what's the appropriate. Yeah, I can just add a little detail um, too. So there were 34 uh, Raven quality assurance testers who wanted, uh, who requested the union, but of the 34 people, there were 12 who were laid off in early December and um, they were going to like, their last day of work is January 28th, which is tomorrow. Um, and even though if they lost those 12 people of the 34 people, they still have a super majority of uh, quality, quality assurance testers who wanted a union. So they were not concerned like, okay, if the 12 people leave, we still have enough. Um, and then of those 20 people who were not any of those laid off, they were the ones pulled into the meeting with management on Monday telling them like they're going to be in animation, in design and engineering, in audio, and I mean, five of them or, or one of them are in these different departments instead of being in this one uh, cohesive team. So that was kind of um, the context behind uh, like moving all these people over um, in QA. And then, you know, I, yeah, I, I just kind of wonder if, um, you know, beyond this issue, if there's, um, like we can also talk about, you know, just like, uh, is it, how do we define the the bargaining unit and and can management ask for 300 people uh to hold a vote I, i'm kind of curious about your thoughts on that well, they can certainly ask for it <laughs> <laughs> yeah they can certainly ask for it and the nlrb uh can hold a hearing where they examine um the there are certain criteria to establish whether something is an appropriate bargaining unit. And it is a whole list of factors as to whether these employees have what's called a community of interest. And in cases where the union seeks a small discrete unit within a larger, um, a larger place of employment, there are different tests as to whether this smaller group can be an appropriate unit apart from the larger group. And this is something that the NLRB is famous for flip-flopping doctrines every time the White House changes. And so during the Obama board, a decision issued which made it a little bit easier for a small discrete group of employees to obtain a separate bargaining unit. But that decision was reversed by the Trump board. I have great confidence that the new Biden board will be looking for an opportunity to go back to the earlier uh, Obama doctrine. Whether this would be the case where they would do that, I don't know. They, they might or might not. But it's still it, 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 the, the, the legal test or the contours of a discrete, small discrete bargaining unit have been a little bit up in the air. So yes, an employer always has the right to contest the bargaining unit or the scope of the bargaining unit that a union seeks. There may be a hearing and then the NLRB, if there's a disagreement, the, the NLRB has to decide it. You know, this is an interesting moment too, because um, just within the last, I, I can't remember exactly what it was, I'd have to look it up, but within the last Week, the board, the NLRB has invited amicus um, briefs, uh, friend of the court kinds of briefs, to reconsider that question, uh, the one that Wilma was talking about in terms of the smaller units and whether unions should basically have um, a stronger ability to carve out the kind of smaller unit of the larger company. And so even though that case is still in effect from the Trump board that actually makes it harder to do that, the NLRB has said they would like to get input in a particular case that they're looking at. They would like to get input from the public, kind of a public comment through people filing written briefs to say whether they should reconsider that question. And it seems to me, given the makeup of the NLRB right now with the majority um, you know, who are far more likely to be more like the Obama board, right, um, and to be more liberal on this. I, I don't doubt, you know, I would, I would wager that they will overturn existing, you know, position on the smaller units. 
So the timing is is kind of tricky right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, in our in our chat in the chat that's alongside this uh, stream, um, one person is saying that they suspect that the goal on the part of Activision here, the company that you know would obviously be fighting, probably fighting against unionization would be to drag this out as long as possible until like another GOP White House. Could they do that though? Because that's still like a ways off. That would be 2024 at the earliest. Like, is that a thing that a company like Activision Blizzard could do? Or is that just kind of, you know, will will the necessary steps for a union vote have to take place before that? So it's certainly one of the common strategies that employers uh, use is to delay the that uh, the holding of an election they often will use what all whatever legal means possible to to drag things out making arguments and litigating things um i i think it is likely that an election would be conducted assuming that the nlrb goes along and finds that the unit sought is appropriate and orders an election i think it's likely that an election would be held well before a 2024 uh, presidential election. That doesn't, so what can happen though to further drag things out is, so maybe they'll have a hearing on the unit, that'll take some time, then they'll appeal the decision to the NLRB, then they'll hold an election. Let's just say the board says, okay, the quality assurance unit is appropriate. So they'll hold an election, let's say the union wins, Activision can then refuse to bargain so that it can go into court and challenge this unit determination. And that'll take at least another year while it goes through the court appeals process. So it can get dragged out. And I think I mentioned to you a case from the 90s where this issue of quality assurance uh, employees and whether they had to be part of a bigger unit was litigated. And the court of appeals then said, that you couldn't exclude them. This was where the union was seeking everybody but the quality assurance. And the uh, the court said, well, you can't exclude them. They're part of the broader unit. And, you, and a union is not entitled, the court said, this was the Court of Appeals in New York City, the union's not entitled to seek to organize just to the extent that it's organized the people. And so mm. I could see Activision making an argument like that here that, well, the extent of the unions organizing so far is just these people, but that doesn't mean it's an appropriate unit. So there, obviously, there are many contrary arguments that can be made. Uh, as Reese and I both mentioned, I think the NLRB is likely to, to go back to the doctrine that makes it a little easier to organize just a discrete group of workers. But all of this takes time. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I don't think it's necessarily dragged out till 2024, but it it, it perhaps won't be resolved this year. Hmm. Um, so that actually brings me to another question, which is like the super majority. Um, so Raven uh, quality assurance testers have a super majority, but um, I know the rest of Raven software, they have not achieved a majority of union votes quite yet. They're still working on it. Do you think that they could, in the meantime, as they're waiting for an election, waiting for a hearing, uh, waiting for the next steps, um, these workers can reach out to other workers and try to get each of them to sign more union cards in the meantime, and then try to work towards a majority. Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly, you know, they they can keep organizing, right? And one of the things that has impressed me in just following what's going on at Raven is that the is the combination of the courage of of the employees, the QA employees to speak out to take action and the fact that there were other Activision employees who joined in solidarity with the strike it seemed to me that that was really impressive so you know depending on um you know what the the union and the employees decide to do certainly building solidarity is a good thing to do. And building support for each other in this situation um, by non-QA employees with the QA employees is something that's happening. So it, it, whether it has to do with the bargaining unit or not, I think that solidarity is something that the union may well be considering, but it may also be 
useful for them to be continuing to get people to sign up. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, um, it, in the event, I'm not saying it's likely, but in the event the NLRB would say it has to be a larger unit, the union would have an opportunity to provide more cards and support so that they could go ahead with the mm -hmm. unit, a, an election in the larger unit. You know, that happened at Amazon um, where the election last spring in Bessemer, Alabama, where the union originally filed thinking the unit was about 1,500 and they had cards, sufficient cards to file for an election. Amazon came back and said, no, it's not 1,500. It's more like whatever, five or 6,000. And the union decided not to fight the unit issue. They just accepted it, ran out and got cards signed. And so they did have the election in the larger unit. Of course, they didn't win that. Um, but so to go back to your question, yeah, that's always an option. And presumably the union is continuing to sign people up. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, the, uh, the, the Amazon, the attempted Amazon union election also, I think provides an interesting kind of point of comparison to look at in a couple ways, because earlier we were talking about like, what happens if it becomes apparent that Activision Blizzard made a lot of their decisions about how to break up the QA unit based on timing and on sort of like prior knowledge that maybe something like this would occur. Um, but if we look at like Amazon, there were all these different ways that they clearly, you know, fairly clearly tried to interfere with the union election um, to the point where it's, I think, what, it still remain, remains under NLRB review right now? No, there's a new election order. Oh, that's right. That's right. So yeah, all of that happened. And so on one hand, like, it is definitely possible for, you know, companies to get caught interfering like this and face consequences. But on the other hand, I think that I've seen a fair number of people look at that and say, well, the Amazon in that case already got to do a lot of the damage and kind of so doubt as to whether a union was good or like what might happen if there was a union. And so like, is that kind of the state of things in terms of what companies can do now? Like they can interfere and face consequences, but the damage they do can often outweigh the benefits of maybe what the law is able to make up for in terms of saying like, okay, it's time for another election now. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, that's been a long time problem. Mm -hmm. um, there has been a lot of discussion about labor law reform over the years. There's, you know, ongoing discussion with the proposed PRO Act, um, Protecting the Right to Organize Act, um, which, of course, will be very hard to get through given the nature of, of uh, federal politics and Congress. But, mm -hmm. there, you know, I think that Everybody who looks at the National Labor Relations Act over the years sees the benefits of the law for workers to be able to organize, to unionize, to improve their working conditions. Uh, and um, I, I actually started as a board agent down in Atlanta. I was a field attorney down there in the South. And so these kinds of tactics are the kinds of things that you just see all the time, that you have a law that's designed to encourage people to unionize and give them the rights to do it, and the law is not strong enough in both the interpretation as well as the remedies to discourage um, employers from using strong anti-union tactics that, on the one hand, may be lawful, even though they scare the employees, and even if the employer crosses the line and violates the National Labor Relations Act, they may do a cost-benefit analysis and say it's worth it because we'll intimidate people and ultimately win in the end. And that can happen in a second election, like in Amazon. But of course, the hope is from people you know who support yeah. um, <laughs> unionization efforts and that employees should be able to choose this. The hope is that those kinds of tactics at least sometimes will backfire mm -hmm. when employers use them. And then employees will say, you know, we're going to go in there and we're going to exercise our right to vote for a union. And that these intimidation tactics were just simply not going. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Shannon. Oh, yeah. I'm also um, curious. I don't know if you have a follow up on that exactly. I actually was going to change the topic to. Um... Oh, I do have a quick follow up on that then. Yeah. Um, just very quickly, like, then let's say, for example, that because I'm just curious about what happens in this exact instance. 
um, let's say that it does become apparent from like a legal standpoint that Activision Blizzard's, you know, kind of decision to do this like breakup of the of the uh, QA unit, like that that is some form of tampering or something like that. Um, like what happens then? What is the consequence for that? Don't do it. <laughs> it's basically the remedies are very weak. It's basically an order to cease and desist from what mm -hmm. you've done that was bad to post a notice in the workplace saying we won't do it again. I mean, <laughs> if there's been any um, monetary consequence, which it doesn't sound like there is here, mm -hmm. um, if there's no monetary consequence, there's no monetary remedy. So, mm -hmm. the re as as Risa said that. The incentive not to break the law is is almost non-existent. If an employer really wants to utilize all possible means, legal and questionably legal, available, and they figure they'll nip it in the bud, and even if down the road they have, to, let's say they fire a leading union organizer, even if they're ordered to put that person back to work and give them some back pay, the 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 remedy itself is so weak and pet and 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 um cheap too because if you, if you fire someone for unlawfully fire someone for engaging in union activity you have to give them back pay but the amount you pay them is reduced by what the person may have made in the interim and the person has an obligation to look for work so if they don't look for work, if they just, you know, sit home and watch TV or something, they're going to be penalized in their back pay anyway under the existing long-standing board doctrine. So it, even a monetary remedy is pretty small. Um, and employers sometimes think if it is, if it kills the union drive, it's worth it, even if down the road the NLRB says, you know, you were bad, you broke the law. Mm-hmm. Oh, it kind of reminds me. Oh, God. yeah. I was just going to say, on the other hand, you know, I'm, I'm probably a truly an incurable optimist, but I don't think that you can be in this business without doing that. Um, I do think, especially in the way that this scenario has has played out, you know, starting with the sexual harassment charges against Activision Blizzard, the findings um, by the state as well as the the settlement and C. Uh, the the sort of solidarity that employees are showing, that it seems to me that a finding by the NLRB that Activision Blizzard violated the National Labor Relations Act by trying to dilute the manipulate where employees the QA employees are working, that that could possibly really backfire against Activision Blizzard because again I've been very impressed with the sort of solidarity that these employees are showing and the way in which employees who were not directly affected stood up for them. So, you know, it could be that that uh, the employer's bet doesn't pay off for them and that people just say, uh-uh, you know, we we see what's happening here. We're not going to stick with the union. Hmm. There's always the reputation factor, mm -hmm. um, particularly with being in the news a lot. Uh, particularly with a pending acquisition. Um, I, I gather that the SEC is also looking at some aspects. So um, it, it is conceivable that the public scrutiny and the reputational aspects will color the strategy that they choose to adopt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's also the ongoing um, NLRB uh, complaint that the division work workers filed in September, and there's uh, two additional charges to it, but general gist of the charges are that um, management has been retaliating against employees um, who are trying to unionize, and they've been uh, dragging them into meetings, um, holding them, uh, and, and, and you know talking to them, intimidating them. So that's kind of the, the complaint that's been going on for the past few months, and um, we're not really sure what the, I mean, it's, it's still ongoing, so there's no outcome yet, but that is in the background of all of these other things, I don't know if you think there's like synergy between them or one could affect the other. Sure. Well, down the road, you know, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it also could affect the timing of an election. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sometimes if there are unresolved unfair labor practices, 
that um, an election is put off so that the election can be held in the most fair conditions as possible. So that's obviously a, a choice that the that the union would have to weigh as well. Um, can that benefit the employer though? Like if the employer is hoping to delay an election anyway, then could they behave in a way that is like unfair to purposefully get it delayed? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> well, um, no, I'm, though I I wouldn't say yes to the exact way you worded the question, mm -hmm. but but um, <laughs> it it most employers think. I believe that it is to their interest to delay an election as long as possible mm -hmm. because that union strength will over time be diluted either just on its own due to the passage of time or due to active anti-union campaigning by the employer. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, this is also part of like, uh, as Shannon said, in kind of like that, in, in that complaint, there was the idea that Activision Blizzard was pulling employees aside into meetings and stuff like that. But generally, aren't they like that? That's a thing that a lot of companies do. I was under the impression that like they they can do that once they're aware at least that there's a union election that's going to happen. Well, they can do it anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, unfortunately, employers have a massive amount of power uh, to control what happens. And that includes what are called captive audience meetings, where the employees are required to go in a group to listen to employer speeches, then many of which would include anti-union statements, but don't cross the line to being unlawfully coercive. Mm -hmm. uh, employers can do one-on-ones. Uh, you know, lots of employers also tell their supervisors, keep your ear to the ground. If you hear anything, people talking about, you know, like buzzwords like living wage, or um, they're talking in groups, you know, let you know, management know about that, you know, because the supervisors are, if they are, legally defined as supervisors under the National Labor Relations Act are management's agents. And so the rest of management is probably asking them, let us know if there's any union activity. So the, the reality is that for unionization to take place in the United States is not easy. Right? People have to be committed. And you know what I think is is impressive is when unionization does take place and when there's you know, uh, people sticking to the reasons why they want to unionize. I mean, sometimes it's bread and butter, but, you know, the wages, and obviously people care about that. But I think it's also the issue of respect and dignity. And so if people can hold on to that, I think that's one of the ways in which unions organize for the short and the long term. To say, if you join together, you have a unified voice get to participate in bargaining at the workplace and that's what we're that's what we're organizing for is that mm -hmm. kind of respect and dignity and participation with a strong voice together at the workplace mm -hmm. yeah and i think those are some of the issues that um the workers have raised you know is the excessive overtime working late in evenings and, and weekends um trying to fix glitches and call of duty warzone and other games and um just like the I think a lot of them had to relocate to Wisconsin, but they weren't offered any assistance uh, until uh, some of the 12 people were laid off Then Activision Blizzard management and retroactively said, yeah, we would pay for you to, to move there um, uh, since you since we're laying you off as well. Um, and then there's just other work conditions. And in the background of that is all the sexual harassment and misconduct and gender based discrimination uh, allegations that I don't know if you think that. Um, since it's such a massive company with all this spotlight on them and uh, with all these harassment allegations that just have gone on for months um, in, in this news cycle, um, would that maybe give people morale to keep fighting? Well, I mean, I think so. And, and also, you know, it, it, I think this kind of conduct by people at the top of the company, the, the fact that, uh, you know, the, there was knowledge, apparently, by you know the head of the, the company that all of the sexual harassment um, was going on. Uh, the way in which the anti-union statements are being put out, you know, these meetings, etc. It makes the statements by um, uh, management that we really care about you ring a little hollow. 
you know, we can, you know, work this all out because we're so much better internally of, of doing this one-on-one. -on -one. It, it just doesn't really ring very true when you see people moving to Wisconsin and then being laid off uh, without, you know, any concern. So, you know, I think that can play in. Mm -hmm. You know, also, I think that the, as workers familiarize themselves with the notion of acting together, acting collectively, and raise their voices together rather than individually, in protest or um, in in support of some in protest of certain conditions or in support of improved conditions, they find they learn about the value of acting collectively. So it kind of feeds on itself and mm -hmm. becomes kind of contagious. <clears throat> so I, I would say that all of these issues give add fuel to the fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they that that that's interesting though because. On one hand, you definitely have, I think, a spirit of collective action kind of burgeoning in the games industry, um, in part because of these issues, in part also because video game companies are very, I think, used to working collectively. Like they are these massive productions that require everybody to sort of work in tandem for anything to happen. Um, but at the same time, I think in the specific instance, you also have a lot of people kind of getting fed up with just the sheer volume of mistreatment and bad news about the company that they're at and leaving and so like with this thing sort of happening where a lot of people are voluntarily leaving the company do you think that could stand to hurt organization efforts simply because you have new people coming in you have long time people leaving and so there's just this kind of turnover that you know might impact how people feel as a unit a turnover is, is often an, an issue in mm -hmm retaining the support that the union has. But, you know, classically, people have looked at this option of expressing your voice or exit. You have, if you don't like what the situation is, you can either come together and express your voice or you can just leave. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it sounds like at the moment from what you say that maybe their employees are doing a little of both. But uh, I'm sure that the hope of those who are remaining and expressing their voice is that that will gain momentum and give people a reason not to leave and mm -hmm. the things will improve. You know, there's yeah. another aspect to people sticking with it that I think sometimes we don't talk about, which is that it's really fun to organize with other people, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's something both individually and collectively um, empowering. And that word empowering probably gets tossed around uh, too much, but I think it really works here. Mm -hmm. That there is that sort of magic to joining with other people. It's like the molecules change in the air. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I've been saying that I've been impressed with these employees because when I see what they're doing and I hear, you know, explanations and comments from some of the workers, it sounds like that's at work, that that, that sense of connectedness of collective consciousness of, gee, when we're working together, we enjoy ourselves, we appreciate what each other's doing and that we're standing up for what we believe in. Like Wilma said, that, that can be contagious. Other people can, can also feel that and it builds a sense of collective empowerment that then makes one individually feel like staying. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. you know, the, the example I often turn to is, remember a few years ago when very quickly there was organized a, a walkout at Google by 20,000 mm -hmm. Google engineers worldwide. That happened very quickly. It was immediately triggered by the New York Times story about the huge severance payment that was given to a top Google executive to kind of smooth over sexual misconduct. Um, but they organized very quickly in response to that, went out on strike, had four demands, got at least one or two of them accepted immediately. So these kinds of things can be triggered very quickly and can um, really kind of explode very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would well, say of the people connected that I... to that. Oh, sorry. No, oh. I was just yeah, going to say connected to that. There's in the news about the CEO once Microsoft comes in, possibly getting a a very large payout, which I think will anger people a lot, given, you know, connection with the sexual harassment issues. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to add briefly that, um, yeah, of the uh, union organizers I've talked to, they are, like, very passionate about the company. They actually like the games that are created by Activision and by Blizzard, and that's why they went to go work there in the first place. And so they kind of like there are also like other people at the company they enjoy the comp they enjoy being around and and so it's not uh, so they're kind of separating what management has done from the rest of the company and they would like to fix the issues they are seeing instead of just like tossing the whole thing away and starting over. Um, but yeah, I I also had a, another thought actually from the live chat which mentioned that like Wisconsin is a very like uh, Madison, Wisconsin is a very left leaning city. Um, uh, actually, the if if hypothetically if this all went to a hearing and if like management was saying you have to have 300 people voting and uh, the workers say 34 people, um, that's going to be overseen by this board in Minneapolis and the regional um, um, board. So I'm wondering if you think that whether or not this board is left leaning or, or right leaning is going to have an impact on the outcome of that hearing if that happens. Well, I mean, it, the hearing may be held by a regional director, um, but ultimately the decision I feel pretty confident would be the NLRB in Washington, which is majority of a Biden appointees right now, um, unless there's a decision and then the parties just decide to go with it, whatever it might happen to be. So um, I, I don't think the, the, the political leaning of the regional director in Minneapolis makes a difference. Mm -hmm. whatever it is i have no idea what it is <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so i i actually have a couple of questions about kind of broader i think perception of this because one thing that y'all were talking about is the kind of contagiousness of you know organizing and seeing people work together and um i i'm curious about this because i think that as somebody who primar primarily reports on video games i'm kind of in a bubble but to me it feels like there is we're we're kind of having a moment not just at Activision Blizzard but also kind of across the video game industry of favorability toward unionization and even like some direct collective efforts on the parts of employees at other companies there was a smaller ind independent developer recently that actually did fully unionize albeit with the approval of their management so there was no drawn out process um but then even beyond that there are companies like Ubisoft where they have workers who have organized, again, kind of in reaction to misconduct and things like that, um, in ways where they have like, they're, they're not officially unionized, but they have like a Twitter account for like their sort of, you know, collective statements. Um, it is one that frequently signal boosts Activision Blizzard and vice versa. So they're kind of like working together. Has that sort of escaped from this, you know, the video game bubble though? Is, are these things that people in the labor community or the labor rights community have heard about, or is it kind of still like, is that more to simmer than a boil? You mean specifically with the the gaming? Kind yeah, of just sort of is, is the broader perception like that we're that video games are close to sort of this moment of you know broader labor rights organizing, um, or is it mostly just like Activision Blizzard that people are following right now? sense is that uh, kind of a broader sense of people outside the mm -hmm. gaming industry. You know, I'm not perhaps the best person to, <laughs> to talk about the gaming industry in certain ways, but um, this story certainly got my attention. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the uh, voluntary recognition company is called Vodeo. Yep. Vodeo. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Vodeo. Um, you know, I thought that was really interesting that an employer actually voluntarily recognized a union. And I think it's, um, it can get your attention because it's unusual for employers to voluntarily recognize a union. Mm -hmm. But this kind of big story of Activision Blizzard and then the purchase that's being planned by Microsoft, that gets people's attention outside of the industry mm. because these are classic kinds of labor uh, collective activities, sort of typical employer anti-union responses. Mm -hmm. And I think that it fits into the broader context, particularly during the pandemic, of a lot of collective action taking place outside of, sort of traditional formal unionization. Mm -hmm. And when employees are protected under the National Labor Relations Act to engage in that kind of collective action to try to improve their working conditions or to complain about you know, working conditions generally. So I think that my take on it is that this sort of collective action that 
bubbled up here, say in Activision Blizzard, then culminating immunization efforts, mm -hmm. is the sort of things that that links to what was going on in the pandemic. As workers said, "Well, wait a minute, you're calling us essential, but mm -hmm. you're putting us in dangerous situations. We need mm -hmm. to act together." And they did that regardless of whether they were unionized. Mm -hmm. I think also there's much um, greater attention and, and interest in the interest of tech in industry employees mm -hmm. in general, which of course have been historically non-union, but um, little by little, there seems to be a lot of um, tumult amongst mm -hmm. uh, employees, whether it's formally union or just more informal worker advocacy and collective action. But certainly we're, the, people are aware of that. Um, and there's been a lot of organizing amongst new media companies. So different kinds of employees, particularly younger workers, uh, mm -hmm. white collar people with some technical skills. Um, and certainly there's, um, I think the the interest goes beyond just the ga video gaming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with that in mind, uh, sorry, there's, there's a question in chat that I think we're going to, that I want to get to really fast. Um, I want to rephrase it a little bit. Um, basically with that in mind, with like broader perception and kind of all of that in mind, um, one person in chat was saying like, do the people who play these games have any role in how this process evolves? And I am wondering kind of to piggyback off that, just like what role public perception plays in all of this? Because like, you know, the people who play these games are in many ways, like the general public, albeit younger skewing. Um, my, my first thought on seeing that question was like, obviously people who play these games could be like, oh. I don't approve of the actions this company is taking part in. I'm going to not spend money. I'm going to, you know, vote with my wallet, so to speak. Um, but is there any other way that public perception would kind of factor into this, especially from the direct audience that this company purports to serve? Well, it seems like organized efforts by people who are, you know, feel connected to the gaming industry because they play the games and they look for them to come out and they're really interested in whether they're good quality. Mm -hmm. that that's the sort of voice that can also be collective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, uh, consumers can make their voice known individually and collectively about their view of this. And they can, um, you know, through that, those kinds of mechanisms put pressure on the company to, to act ethically, to voluntarily recognize the union. And so, you know, there, there certainly has been a, a history of, consumer boycotts, consumer action, and there I don't think there's an even uh, way to describe that. I don't think there's just one outcome. In fact, mm -hmm. but I certainly think that that sort of collective pressure can be. Yeah. And so it goes back to what we talked about earlier with the reputation. Mm -hmm. If there is some expression of disapproval of taking a hardline approach. I mean, I'll tell you just one real small example that just happened here in Washington, D.C. There's a wonderful bookstore called Politics and Prose. And a few months ago, there was a story about how the employees wanted to organize. Uh, I guess they had sought voluntary recognition and the store announced that they had gotten a lawyer and they were not going to voluntarily recognize and, you know, the, they'd have to go to the NLRB. Well, pressure was brought to bear, I guess, on the owners because they changed lawyers. They entered into a voluntary recognition agreement. They had a card check and the union is now recognized. So that was, it's a small scale, obviously, but that kind of pressure can be brought to bear even in a, in a larger world, particularly given social media and all different ways that expressions of support can be can be made so it's uh, i don't know what the what the sentiment of the video game community is if there is any kind of consensus but in in theory sure it could have an, an impact to answer your question uh broadly negative toward activision blizzard at this point um they they have definitely i think carried quite a bit of anti-favor at this point um yeah, yeah well, and, and the consumers want good games, right? So quality assurance people are quite important yeah. for that. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I just did an article last week about how many uh, mistakes, how many glitches are in the games uh, now when when the quality assurance people were on strike. And then I interviewed some gamers who were very upset. They're like, 
forklift driver and a construction worker, and they were, they were saying, oh, I didn't know about the, the, the strike and their efforts to unionize, but, you know, I'm in support of labor, obviously. So I, um, they, they were in support of um, these workers when they heard about the strike, even if it affected how many bugs and glitches were in this game. Um, but yeah, I mean, I also, I just, this, there was like one more interesting question I wanted to raise, um, if we still have time. It's just, um, there was a Japanese company, a uh, game company called Voltage, that um, their uh, writers uh, went on strike uh, for for many days, and then they got uh, approval uh, for a union um, even. And then just like a week after that, or like a little bit after that, this month, um, uh, Voltage, the Japanese company, shut down the U.S. division, uh, which contained that, you know, soon-to-be union. Um, and I was wondering you know if that's lawful or if there is something that those workers can do well you know it, that that's an uphill battle um and i'm sure you know uh, roma can all certainly i hope will weigh in on this but i think it quickly at least briefly it it may be an unfair labor practice that that is something unlawful under the national labor relations act but it will depend on how it's defined. If this is what's called viewed as a partial closing of a business, then that might um, be unlawful in if it discriminates on the basis of union activities, but in particular if it was designed to um, discourage or um, um, chill, discourage or chill unionization in the remaining parts of the company. So to some extent, it'll be an evidence base to say, well, what is it that the company did? And if it's partial closing of the business, then there could be an unfair labor practice charge brought. Those are not easy cases to win, but the timing certainly sounds suspect. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to rely on what Risa said because I have to I, I confess that I sort of lost the, the, the trend of what the facts were. So I would have to ask you to repeat them, and I don't want to do that with a minute left. Yeah, I think it all depends on whether it's a partial closing of the business, mm. and and that would be based on the evidence. Right. And were they unionized? Yeah, I think they they haven't they hadn't been unionized. They were just in, in the process of doing it. And I think um yeah the reason why I raised this question also because um, Activision Blizzard um they had a studio in France um in Paris and um like like Ubisoft, um, which is also a French company that makes Assassin's Creed, um, you know, the French uh, companies have like, oh, well, France it's, in general has a stronger labor laws. And so employees at Blizzard were wondering if the Blizzard Paris studio was shutting down because uh, the company didn't want the workers to unionize. So that's like, it, it brings us back mm -hmm. full circle. Um, but I also asked this to Risa. I know this is uh, outside of the scope of the NLRB because of France. Yeah, definitely. And France does have different labor laws, mm -hmm. a different, yeah. and a whole different model of union organization as well. Hey, Unfortunately, it should be it's also. kind of a typical, not typical, but it does happen that, you know, employers, if we just focus on the U.S. now, will shut down part of a business after the employees unionize or even after the employees engage in union activities. And then if it is a partial closing of the business and the purpose can be proved to discourage unionization in the remaining parts of the business, it would violate the National Labor Relations Act. But those That's can be hard to prove. Okay. And and the you know the courts generally tend to say an employer's entitled to go out of business. Yeah, if it's the entire business. Yeah. Got it. Well thank you for answering that question. Those mm -hmm. I know it's very random. Yeah. Um, yeah, and now uh, I, I think we're at about the point at which the two of you have to go, but if there are any closing or parting thoughts you'd like to share with regard to all of this, feel free. Well, thank you for having us. It's been an interesting discussion, and it's my first time on um, on this, uh, this, on this platform, <laughs> so I, I feel like my day has been uh, enlivened. <laughs> Same here. Thank you. And it's so nice to be on the same program with Wilma Liebman, who I have known for a long time and admired for a long, an even longer time. And, and likewise. Um, <laughs> and nice, to, nice to meet both of you. You have a really interesting beat. Yeah. You do.
Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. Nice to meet both of you as well. I knew the Washington Post had a whole vertical on video gaming. I didn't know. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people say that. that but someday, you. everyone will know. <laughs> Bye. Bye. All right. Time to roll right into our next, next segment, which is something we can do now because it's set up that way. It's really cool. Um, so for those who have not watched our show before, um, in the aftermath of, you know, our main segment, also, hello, Ditto, who just said hi in chat. Um, but anyway, in the aftermath of our first segment where we tackle a big story, then we move on to a bunch of these smaller stories from throughout the week um, and sort of just talk about those really quickly. So let's do that. Um, let's see, there are a number of things that occurred this week. I guess one that I want to hit really quickly, just because, uh, you know, we have written about it and are going to play it tomorrow, in fact, is that there's a new mm -hmm. Pokemon game, which, oh, yeah. yeah, which looks pretty neat. I mean, I guess it's like a total reinvention of the series, but also it's kind of glitchy and janky and doesn't look very good, <laughs> like visually, I mean, like it looks like a good game. Um, but yeah, so we published a review of that this week. Yeah, I'm excited um, to try this. I wanted to try this um, for the review, but I didn't have time at all. I'm glad we managed to cover it. Yeah, right. I mean, it looks neat. Like, I I definitely am interested in kind of anything that sort of purports to be like series, whatever, but Breath of the Wild. <laughs> so like, and um, I, I think that a sentiment I've seen shared a lot about this game is that it actually makes a Pokemon world feel kind of like dynamic and alive. Yeah, and probably. that's sort of always been, as, as the series has gone on, I think it's become more and more apparent that the game worlds they create don't feel that way a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Like I think back when we were kids, you know, the early Pokemon games blew everybody's minds. But then as those games kind of failed to evolve over time, their seams started to show. So it became this thing of like, oh yeah, actually, you know, you walk through this world, and like you go past a past trainer and they want to battle you, then they're just going to stand there forever. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I reviewed uh, Pokemon Sword and Shield and mm -hmm. I was like, oh, my rival, he's always losing to me. He's so happy. I, I feel really bad for him. I don't even feel compelled to beat him anymore because he's just going to lose to me. And, and you, I mean, the, the best part of that game, of those two games, is like the, the wild area where you can just go and catch Pokemon. And that was like what people were saying is, going to be closer to a breath of the wild again that mm -hmm. comparison comes back up and yeah so i'm kind of i'm really excited for this one because that's what they were promising yeah well yeah and i mean like that that part is just neat to me and like they, there's a parallel there too in that i think legend of zelda also started to feel static after a while in this way where again like it was a tried and true formula and it was a good one but it was still like oh this is not really a living breathing world that you're occupying this is a series of puzzles made deliberately for the player disguised as a world for you to explore and mm -hmm. i think that both breath of the wild and now it sounds like the new pokemon game kind of say like well let's make it more of a world let's make it more of an actual place as opposed to just kind of a series of backdrops you move through yeah i'm also excited because um you know john reviewed this for us uh rcs for us and Game Freak, you know, again with like Sword and Shield and previously like has come under fire for like not making like just not innovating. Not innovating. In the game. Yeah. And also like the animations um in Sword and Shield, I remember they were like there's like a jump um mm -hmm. animation and it's just like a foot. Like just like a <laughs> photo of a foot. And it's like what <laughs> you couldn't I, I did a whole article for CNN where we were just like compiling all the angry gamers who were like, Why did you not animate this foot and could you do better next time? So <laughs> yeah, maybe RCS is better, but we'll see. I mean, I don't know. I, I wish that every game just like put a JPEG of a foot up when you jumped. <laughs> I think that'd be amazing. <laughs> oh. Yeah, well, have I got the game for you? <laughs> um, also, uh, James Jackson just said not to get off topic, but who the heck thought a Michael Jackson musical was a good idea? Well, um, well, that's very off topic. Thanks. It is incredibly <laughs> off topic. I think it's a funny comment, though, so I'm going to acknowledge it. <laughs> um, if I was feeling bolder today, I think that what I would do is like do the michael jackson he he I, but they're like he he probably would have i think you you should be careful we don't want to get dmca <laughs> that's true with my very similar to michael jackson voice if you get picked up <laughs> um let's see oh yeah just another like kind of you know the, this week's like regular video game news was like just games being announced or coming out so like i'm gonna just get through that really fast mm -hmm. um 
yeah, there's some new Star Wars games that got announced this week. Um, you know, if you don't already have enough Star Wars in your life, uh, now there's going to be more specifically Respawn Entertainment, which is a developer of Titanfall, Apex Legends, um, games like that, and also Jedi Fallen Order, which was mm-hmm. their first foray into Star Wars. They're making a sequel to Jedi Fallen Order. They're doing a first-person shooter of some sort. They, they've they not really said what kind of shooter it's going to be. And then they are also doing production on a strategy game that's being developed by former uh, creators of XCOM games. So, like, you know, that all sounds like it could be interesting. Or maybe not. We'll see. EA's track record with Star Wars has been kind of spotty. Like, the Battlefront games have been so-so. Um, Jedi Fallen Order has obviously been good. But, you know, they have, like, a 10-year exclusivity deal with Lucasfilm. Yeah. And they've yeah. managed to produce, like, a single digit number of games in that time and they canceled like a bunch of really highly anticipated ones so yeah i played um star wars squadrons and i reviewed that and i think it was like a 39 dollar game because Mm -hmm. it was so short and you could really feel it um i don't know other people liked it but i was like i i can only see a specific star wars fan enjoying this otherwise yeah (laughs) not for me i mean if you're if you're a star wars person on the upside you have a lot to look forward to now because suddenly everybody's making Star Wars games and uh, they all sound at least relatively diverse. So you have like the Respawn games that we just talked about. Then there's also an open world Star Wars game coming from Ubisoft. They of the open world map game. So I'm sure it's going to be, you know, given how Ubisoft has been these days, it'll probably just be like Far Cry, but with a Star Wars skin on it. But, you know, people will eat that up. Um, let's see. There's Quantic Dream who, uh, you know, they uh, oh, yeah. want to talk about labor issues. They've had oh. quite a few of their own. Um, right. Yeah, being taken to court for it, in fact. Um, but they are making a story-driven Star Wars game called Star Wars Eclipse. It's going to be like a branching narrative game, as they tend to do. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it could be interesting, though. Knowing David Cage's proclivities for storytelling, it will probably also include just some sort of like... It, <clears throat> my guess is it's going to be a twist that will put like the brother sister kiss in the original star wars trilogy to shame it oh will be God. something where you're just like i'm so uncomfortable about this i thought you were gonna say like some kind of parent child death man could be that too <laughs> okay yeah, no. uh as long as we get to run around and push a button and have somebody yell their kid's name over and over in increasingly pained voices that's all yeah. i need um yeah. yeah no just imagine uh i've got to i've got to do this now heavy rain Oh yeah, I was talking Shades about Detroit man. Become Human and Heavy Rain. Both have, well, not to spoil anything, but here we go. So just imagine, like, oh, God. see here. <laughs> you watch this. Yeah, wow. this is really low. It's really terrible graphics, but. This is so frustrating to experience. Now I have to experience it again. I can't believe this. Just imagine this, but Star Wars. Imagine one of those famous, you know, Star Wars shopping malls. One of those scenes. Jason. 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 Oh man. Everyone has like like the Star Wars outfit. I know, right? Like, that that would be the, the only corner. difference. Okay. Otherwise, it's the exact same game. Oh, maybe it's like he's looking for Baby Yoda and like Yoda just like. Left. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, this could. This should absolutely be the beginning of the next season of Mandalorian. Oh. Yeah. yeah. I didn't yeah. make it through that whole show. I, I watched some five, six episodes. It's beautiful, but I'm, I was like, I, I don't know. It's it, You have to really be captivated, and it didn't catch me. Yeah, no, it's like Grogu, Grogu. Um, yeah, no, I, I also haven't watched all of it, though I was reading, this is a big aside, but it's so strange to me. Um, I was reading a recap of the most recent episode of Book of Boba Fett, another show that I don't actually watch, and they apparently just inserted an episode of The Mandalorian into the middle of a limited-run Boba Fett season. Huh. Like the most recent episode of Boba Fett is just an ep- episode of Mandalorian. It's like a setup what? for season three. Wow. The the character it follows is just the Mandalorian. Boba Fett's not even there. <laughs> it's so weird. Mm-hmm. It, it is a bizarre thing for them to do, but you know, whatever. They can yeah. do that if they want, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. I guess they save money. Right. Yeah, right. Another episode. <laughs> I mean, I just think like they they had no real faith in their Boba Fett show at all. It seems very like hey, it's a nostalgia play with not a lot of actual substance. Anyway, um, 
So another big story of this week that is not at all related to Star Wars. I mean, I guess it could be if anybody starts copywriting, copyright striking Star Wars. Um, but yeah, so basically a YouTuber who got hit with hundreds of copyright strikes by an anime company by Toei um, basically ended up getting a win out of YouTube for everyone. So what happened is that this person was getting copyright stricken to heck and back over videos he had made. Mm-hmm. And he sort of just like decided to hang his, he just decided to give up, right? He was like, what do you do at that point? Yeah, more than 150 copyright claims against him <sighs> for anime and manga reviews. Right. And so he was like, well, you know, oh, well, this is terrible, but what can I do? And then apparently was hit up by somebody high up at YouTube. And so as a result of this and just everything around it, YouTube has changed the way it operates such that you can be copyright stricken in one country, but not another one. So your video can stay up in some territories, even if it's taken down in, for example, Japan. Oh, that's so yeah. interesting. The way this is phrased is like uh, someone high up at YouTube loved his videos and was like, I, I can't believe this is happening to you, man. I'll, I'll help you. And <laughs> I mean, look, I, I don't know if it's this way at YouTube, but like it absolutely often works that way at Twitch. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it probably very well could have been that way that mm-hmm. like, you know, in addition to this being a serious issue for the platform that it's good that they changed um like it probably was the it was probably born of somebody at youtube being like yeah i like this person's content and i'm going to you know kind of give them priority and privilege which you know not ideal necessarily but yeah yeah, that's companies (laughs) right yeah i've heard that uh, at twitch as well just like the priority of of certain streamers but yeah Mm -hmm. yeah I mean, the other thing is that like, and again, as, as ever, the important thing to keep in mind is that Twitch is a vastly smaller company than YouTube. And so like Mm -hmm. they, their processes are going to work differently at scale. And so I think you hear fewer stories of this variety coming out of YouTube, whereas at Twitch, they're like a dime a dozen, or at least they used to be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in any case, they, this is probably something that people will cite in the future when their copyright claims made against them. Um, it will also be interesting to see what Twitch does in reaction to this. Will they also adopt similar rules? Um, do they even have the capability to, given their relative lack of manpower compared to YouTube and also the fact that everybody on their platform is live? So, you know, mm-hmm. it's just a different situation. But yeah. I, I think that any major evolution in how we perceive what we call fair use, even if this is not really, I mean, fair use is as ever, as I must remind people constantly, having heard lawyers say it to me a thousand times. <laughs> Um, fair use is born of individual judgments made by a judge and a jury Um, it's a case-by-case thing Mm -hmm. we are not protected by magical fair use bubbles that's not real (laughs) Um, but in any case um, they this something like this does stand to i think uh, alter the way that companies and maybe even judges and juries will approach those laws from now on so Hmm. Yeah, right. that's interesting. Um, I I would say like, oh, I can't wait to see how it transforms YouTube. But like, I can remember when YouTube just started, like when it just launched, people were like mm-hmm. putting full episodes of every anime on there, and that's how I watched all my anime is just like through YouTube. So I think that was like the wild west of mm-hmm. like no copyright claims on, on this platform, and um, anything we can see from from now on is like maybe loosening those rules a little. But you we probably can't get back to that point again no no definitely not i mean yeah well we'll see what happens like again you know right now twitch is kind of embroiled in its own controversy around people streaming tv shows and like while some people have been dmca'd other people haven't so i think it really becomes a matter of just like how much companies care like Mm -hmm. if a if a company like fox or wb or whatever decides to do a platform-wide crackdown or in the case of what happened with youtube you know everything that the platform currently is was born out of viacom suing them in uh 2013 so it's really just when pressure from companies gets to be uh, great enough that things tend to change. And when they do change, it tends to be in a direction away from kind of freedom and openness and right. toward more controlled systems. And right. yeah. So yeah. Um, speaking of YouTube changing, though, the other big announcement on that front this week <laughs> is that the head of YouTube gaming is leaving. So this is the person who I think in many ways spearheaded kind of the the current state of youtube with regards to bringing on a bunch of big name streamers Mm -hmm. and kind of evolving their platform to be more friendly to streamers and streaming and uh those sorts of endeavors yeah i've interviewed ryan a bunch of times um Mm -hmm. yeah he 
I this news took me by surprise. I was like, "Wow, you like head of YouTube gaming is huge, and now you're gonna mm-hmm. um, be a CEO of Polygon Studios." So it's like cryptocurrency content. Yeah, not to be confused with Polygon the website. These are right, totally right. That's what I first thought. I said, "No way," but yeah, no, no, no. Polygon doesn't have a studio. I mean, maybe they do, but they don't have like an official content pipeline like this. So right, right. Yeah, no, Polygon is not doing crypto stuff yet. <laughs> yeah, it's really funny. There's a Verge cryptocurrency. There's also a Polygon cryptocurrency. No association with those media websites. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I guess we have to say that at this point, given mm-hmm. how many people have moved. Yeah, this is, yeah, it's yeah. pretty shocking. So. Yeah, I mean, it's very shocking. Um, it, it It's definitely like, it makes a degree of sense. So... Mm-hmm. I, I have heard from people to whom I speak about stuff that um, the, the basis of this is that uh, Ryan kind of ended up getting an offer that he couldn't turn down. Like the offer from Polygon is just a very good one. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, yeah, head of YouTube gaming is a very good position. And I imagine that he was paid handsomely while he was there. Mm-hmm. So, you know, read between the lines. And I think Polygon just made him a better one, a, a such an such an incredibly good one. Um, that between that and the fact that like he's he he's been a, a Web three guy for a while, mm-hmm, that, yeah. like it was an aligning of his interests, yeah. and then in addition, it, it seems like maybe things at YouTube were getting a little bit stagnant for his tastes. Um, oh okay. Oh yeah. Hmm. So yeah, that, that, that last part is really interesting. Oh, mm-hmm. but yeah, I don't know. I just said something about how like all the the money and and um is is heading towards cryptocurrency. Um, Venture capitalists, Silicon Valley, like they're looking yeah. at NFTs and blockchain. So, yeah, that yeah. doesn't surprise me that they could give a better offer, even if they're lesser known. And well, yeah, and the other thing is like, on. yeah, and it is sort of this thing of like, you know, Ryan is far from the first person I've seen move from the kind of like influencer space to the crypto Web three space. Um, there's been a ton of you know Twitch departures in the past year, year and a half. Um, and a lot of the ones that are relatively high profile were then followed by them being like, and I'm going to this, in a, like this crypto company or this NFT company or this mm-hmm. NFT endeavor incubator, whatever. Um, so yeah, I mean, that feels like the way that a lot of people in tech are shifting in general right now. Um, yeah, yeah. I know game developers moving to work on cryptocurrency games as well. Like, mm-hmm. So yeah, that also makes sense or not even cryptocurrency games but like blockchain based games and and i try to play these games i open their website <laughs> it's it's a web page but you i guess you need to really like get ethereum and then get really into it um but yeah just from now it, it looks like a web page i think i've asked them i said you know are you going to make this mm-hmm. four, three-dimensional and they're like maybe maybe we'll yeah maybe out. one day this will be an actual video game or maybe not who knows <laughs> depends on what gets us the most money um right but yeah the question now becomes for youtube um, and especially for like streamers on YouTube and kind of their plans there, like will, how, how instrumental, and I, I hope to interview Ryan about this in the near future. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I was hoping to get him on the show this week. It didn't work out. Um, mm-hmm. but how instrumental was he in kind of the moves that YouTube made in recent times to pick up major streamers, um, like Dr. Lupo, Tim, the Tatman, um, Ludwig, even before that Valkyrie courage. Um, all of these big names. And then I think even more interesting in terms of kind of the interests of streamers in general, how instrumental was he in saying like, okay, the terms of your contract are going to be significantly fewer hours than what Twitch might offer you. Mm -hmm. Um, Because like, you know, even if a platform like YouTube is only picking up a small handful of streamers in the grand scheme of things, um, just by making those the terms of the deal, they're forcing platforms like Twitch to maybe change the way that they operate in a direction that makes streamers careers more sustainable right right yeah that that's true as well i don't i don't know how um large youtube gaming is and like whether or not ryan is the one doing all brokering all these deals it seems like it would have to be like a team of lawyers and like team yeah. of agents and um and that he would just oversee the strategy and maybe like ask them to to poach more talent um mm-hmm. but yeah that that is interesting i do know that he was like on paternity leave for for a bit there mm-hmm. um and then he came back um so i don't actually I didn't like follow him all the way through the last year of, of him at, at YouTube gaming, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, he just always seemed like a really nice, uh, friendly person. And it did seem like the streamers uh, under him had better terms at least. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, I mean like in, in a piece that I did about why major streamers were leaving Twitch, 
yeah, that was like one of the quotes he gave me. He was like, I think stream grind is a real thing. I think stream burnout is a real thing. I'm not trying to bring people over here to stream 150 to two hours per month. I don't yeah. think that's healthy. It's not what we're trying to create at YouTube. And so my my kind of you know question then is whoever they bring on to kind of move all this forward at YouTube, do they have a similar philosophy? And then also, even if they don't, does it matter? Or is the kind of YouTube machine big enough and self-perpetuating enough that it will keep moving in this direction regardless of who's kind of at the head of it? And I think we'll see. Yeah. Well, yeah, just even from the size of it and like looking at the kinds of games that are like the top games, um, like Garena Free Fire, for instance, mm -hmm. um, that is like the massive game on YouTube that I think a lot of people have not heard of either. Um, mm -hmm. It's just like very successful on its own. It might be a self perpetuating machine. So yeah, that's yeah. an interesting question to definitely ask. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in that. And then also like, because I, I think the thing that Ryan did really well is that he was very public facing in a way that made YouTube seem even more appealing than Twitch and that like Twitch is very quiet in a mm -hmm. lot of matters. Um, and when they finally issue statements, it's often like kind of late and mm -hmm. people are already like mad at them for a million other things. And yeah. their statements are also very impersonal. Meanwhile, Ryan's whole thing is like, if there is any major announcement or any new feature or whatever, he would be on Twitter, like at replying to everyone. <laughs> I mean, I think in the aftermath of like one of their major signings, I think that he maybe did like 50 replies in one day. I was just like going through his tweets being like, man, this is all you did today, huh? Wow. Yeah. yeah I, I didn't realize he was doing that. I, I just know he was really available for interviews every time anyone, well, mm -hmm. anyone like, like I think it was uh, Valkyrie probably and Courage that I like was able to speak to, to him about. And then yeah. I think, um, I mean, the head of Facebook gaming also strikes me as someone who like was also very available. His name <laughs> escapes my mind. But yeah, he... Like Facebook gaming was also very, very proactive. And I think the two of them were that way in contrast to Twitch being the incumbent, like live streaming platform. Like mm -hmm. they don't really have yeah, to do absolutely. much. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Speaking of Twitch. Uh, so they made, they announced a deal that they made today that was on the fence about writing about. I decided not to, because it's basically the same deal that they had already made with other music publishers the basic mm -hmm. idea is that today they announced that they struck a deal with universal music group mm -hmm. um, which is one of the bigger music collectives out there um in order to basically like again kind of the main way that this impacts most streamers is that now if you get d if you get reported for like playing some of their music you may n you won't necessarily instantly get banned they there's now kind of Twitch has established a background process to handle some of this um, so that you will instead like receive a warning or something like that um, as opposed to like a, a an irrevocable strike against your account that could, you know, instantly ruin your career. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, like they already did this last year with the NMPA, mm -hmm. um, which is the National Music Publishers Associ Associ Association. Wow. Mm -hmm. That is very hard to say. Um, that's probably why they shortened it to NMPA. But anyway, yeah. But right. the the crux of it, which remains the same here, is that streamers still can't play licensed music. Um, mm -hmm. And I bring this up only because the way that they kind of fra phrase this at the beginning sounds so not like that. It's such weird phrasing. Okay, so it's, we're excited to share the news that we've entered into an agreement with Universal Music Group that give gives give. yeah Come it's on. also a typo well that's sorry twitch um that gives music fans on twitch access to some of the world's most popular music artists okay like pause there okay cool sounds okay. like if i were if i was a streamer reading this announcement i'd be losing my mind at that phrase i'd be like oh, oh. my god they did it we can play copyrighted music and then unpause yeah. by fostering the creation of channels for artists and labels. Oh, okay. And bringing so, exclusive oh. music based content to Twitch. Oh, okay. Well, I, I, I saw your tweet about this and I was really confused. I didn't have time to like really digest this statement. This whole thing is so hard to understand. So it's a good thing that you're talking about this now because mm -hmm. like the in, indecipherable. But um, okay. So they're saying what? Like artists can have channels, but not like, regular streamers? Okay. Yeah, no. Basically, they, they are saying that artists and labels will be allowed to play their own music on their channels. <laughs> That's it. Wait, I, I thought they could do that already. <laughs> I mean, you'd be surprised. Okay. Like it, it's it, it can be 
unsafe enough territory that I think some artists might have been looking at this and being like, I don't know if I want to go on Twitch because I might get in trouble for playing my own music. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was like following T Pain. He just like I guess he was making original new beats. So he was. Sense. Yeah. Okay. No, he was making original new beats. And then, so he also like licenses out music. Basically, he right. makes his own pack of music that streamers can use without fear of copyright claims. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Wow. It's called the Pizzle Pack because he's T Pain. So of course he called it that. Um, yeah, there are a lot of like, I mean, a lot of indie like um, subscription services that like started up and saying you can now play my music because I don't, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna DMCA you. So that actually gave you know birth to this cottage industry over here. So, I mean, I, I still think it's inconvenient because. Yeah, you, know, you you can't play like a top hit, but there there are ways around this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it, but the, this particular yeah framing of the announcement is just very funny to me. Um, yeah. So continues, which is kind of like DMCA saga. Who knows where it will take us next? Um, mm -hmm. In other news of things that Twitch announced this week, but then sort of unannounced. They this one is bizarre. I I don't really know what to make of any of this yet because of the way that the rollout has happened. Um, so basically, Twitch announced, again, they, they did a blog post, as you can see, this is an official Twitch URL, all that. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they are making a reliable monthly income incentive, or like it's, yeah, it's called an ad incentive program. And the idea is to give streamers a reliably, reliable monthly income in exchange for them streaming a specific hour, number of hours per month with ads, like a, at predetermined intervals. Basically, okay. the idea is TLDR, they want streamers to run more ads and they are willing to pay them consistently for it instead of just kind of like whatever they a streamer ends up pulling in that month mm -hmm. um, based on like the time that they've spent streaming. So like a lot of streamers, um, when they caught wind of this, like publicized how much they made from ads in a month generally. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I mean, unless you are like a really, really big streamer, if you're like a smaller mid-sized streamer, ads are getting you like barely anything like a couple dollars or like ten dollars or 20 or 50. wow like nothing that's a um, contrast to uh youtube mm -hmm. yeah but meanwhile for twitch um they they are an ad powered platform and so they want you to run ads because that's where their money comes from mm -hmm. um so it's you know it makes a lot of sense that they would obviously want to incentivize streamers running ads um but the thing about this is, well, there are a few things about this. One of them is that Twitch put this out there the other day and then took the post down. So, like, they, I think somebody published this by mistake. Wow. Don't it now it just redirects you to their that's, regular that's blog so site. interesting, because this reminds me of, like, the whole Twitch brand score thing, which I was trying to cover, then I ended up mm. not doing it. But, like, basically, you know, uh, some of the streamers had, like, a score attached to them of, like, is this person going to be brand safe? And that was for advertisers to then later be like, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to advertise. Um, I'm, I'm like a friendly diaper brand and I can't advertise on this. <laughs> it's like 18 plus. Um, so, so that to was the like, diaper brands, <laughs> the, the edgy diaper brands. Right. Oh, I adult diaper. Brand. Anyway. Mm. So, so that was like a brand score thing that was also like internal accidentally publicized and then also like, you know, taken down, hidden, and then no comment. And, Hmm. Yeah, very similar to this. Maybe maybe they realized we've publicized this too much. Like this is not something we want people to know about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, they're the uh, sorry, they're the diaper brands for this particular baby. Oh my god, for Bart Harley Jarvis. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, I'm sure. Yeah, this diaper can can go on anybody's stream. Doesn't mm -hmm. matter who. The most yeah, no. streamer, sure. And also, uh, yeah, if people in chat, if you know, you know. Anyway, if you don't, well then uh, watch. Watch, I think you should leave. It's a great show. Um, <laughs> but yeah, anyway, yeah, no, like, um, I think it was one of those rare instances where Twitch kind of like accidentally announced something, which doesn't happen that often. Um, but yeah, there are like multiple factors to this. One is that because of this, like a lot of streamers were like, what's this going to mean for me? And it's really hard to tell right now because this feature is not live. Mm -hmm. um, and the announcement like had, I think, kind of like, um placeholders for how much you could make because the idea is they're structuring it kind of like a bounty board so mm -hmm. you just like see you know if you run these ads this month then you'll make x amount of money at the end of the month assuming that you do it mm -hmm. um because another problem with the system is that like it seems pretty you know married to a specific number of hours so like if you get sick or something and you can't run the number of hours you needed to well then you're not going to make any of that money it's kind of wow. an all or nothing thing 
Um, but even then, like the the placeholder totals that they had were like hundreds of dollars for running, you know, like streaming 40 hours per month and running two ads every or like two ads every hour or something like that. Um, and like, I have a feeling that will not apply to most streamers. So right. if most streamers did that right now, they'd make, you know, a few dollars. So, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Um, but we'll see. Because, again, the, this system is not well understood yet because it's not out in the wild. Um, Maybe they deleted it because they realized all these problems that you're mentioning. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, if they'd already, like, written up this entire blog post, you know, I, I, I don't think that they're going to, like, do takesies backsies on this fully. They just, for some reason, decided the timing wasn't right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's kind of strange. Um, but it also goes back to, like, kind of a central issue with Twitch in general, which is that they want streamers to run ads. But streamers don't want to run ads because ads are like one of the biggest things that make your audience disappear. When like an ad shows up, odds are someone's going to click away. And especially if it's like multiple ads in a row, like forget about it. Yeah. Because yeah. that's like, you know, up to like 30 to 60 seconds of non-stream content. And so in the meantime, because Twitch is live, viewers might be missing something. And also, they're just going to be like, okay, well, I, I don't want to, I didn't come here to, to see ads. So, yeah. like, ads are a terrible proposition for streamers. This is why Twitch would implement something like this because yeah. they, they obviously know. Yeah, I think I've only seen ads like as I open a stream. That's the first thing I see. And then the ad is gone. And I never see another ad again. But even mm -hmm. like that first ad is like, you know, you're, you're losing time from the stream. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're losing a lot of time, um, especially because like, the that's the onboarding for a twitch channel too is like say somebody you know hears about something that's going on on twitter and they're like oh i gotta go see this is happening right now and i want to be mm -hmm. part of it and then they click in and get an ad and like that is the point at which many many people bounce off a particular streamer or even twitch itself yeah um so yeah anyway that's a that's the internal friction of that platform it's fascinating because again twitch wants money so they're going to try to find ways around it. Yeah. Um, let's and then see. Also like pop up blockers. So I don't know. Like that's still going to be, they're still going to have to try to find another way. Anyway. Yeah. Oh, okay, let's see. Um, yeah. James Jackson just said, I moderate a Twitch channel that used to occasionally run ads. It would prompt about a 50% <laughs> drop in audience. <laughs> yeah. That streamer does not run ads anymore. And yeah, I mean, this is true for like a, a lot of mid tier streamers is just like running ads for them. Doesn't make financial sense. Um, if you're a bigger streamer, you can get away with it because if you're streaming to thousands or tens of thousands of people, you know, you're, you're going to lose some people, but most of them are like in for the long haul. But if you are trying to grow your audience and attract an audience, running ads is poison. You're never going right. to do it. But if you really want to get into it, um, monetarily, that mid tier of streamers, that's where Twitch actually makes most of their money. Because big streamers, the biggest, despite pulling in millions of dollars, um, and in fact, in part because because they pull in that kind of money are loss leaders they they lose mm -hmm. twitch money but twitch likes to have them around for the prestige mm -hmm. so the the idea of business mo business model for twitch is to make as much money as possible off of the mid tier and smaller tier and then just eat the loss on big streamers hmm. so yeah it's fascinating <laughs> <laughs> um yeah that that the the thing that i just said explains so many of the decisions twitch makes if in the future you are baffled by something they did just think back to that math and it might make a little bit more sense wow. um yeah that's really interesting um yeah i didn't think about it that way because yeah like they're paying multi-million dollars to these streamers at, at the top and i guess those streamers don't make that money back for them hmm. mm -hmm. um at least not in ads no the as like oh, ads yeah. kind of across the board it's definitely not the ad. yeah mm. but anyway um speaking of streamers who are very big um i just wanted to point to this not because it's like incredibly interesting but because um yeah so cypher pk who's a pretty big streamer um is creating his own production space in like streamer content creator incubator it's like going to be a big facility where people can go to you know become better at content creation oh and yeah become i guess like probably you know but i guess if somebody does this they either pay him a fee or like he collects on some of like the money they're making over time um wow. but yeah i i just find it interesting because it's yet another example of the ways that these the bigger content creators 
are no longer just like individuals. They are companies. They are mm -hmm. institutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in yeah. this case, very literally, Oni Studios, which is producing, putting all of this together, started out as an internal team designed to help manage CypherPK's growing channels. Yeah, I mean, just think about T-Series on YouTube, right? It's a mm -hmm. whole company, um, and it's the biggest, it was the biggest YouTube um, channel. At this point, I, I lost track, but, yeah. like, yeah, just, it seems like, yeah, one person producing content uh, is really hard, and then you have a lot of people, you can make a whole business out of it. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, it's interesting how this happens, too, in the, as you're saying, um, it's very difficult. And so by necessity, content creators build teams around themselves to facilitate that. And then when those teams get big enough, they can suddenly take on ventures of their own. And like, they go from being just support for the streamer to then also creating new sources of income for the streamer or new businesses, in this case, running a 30,000 square foot gaming and production facility um, in Austin, Texas. So like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's interesting to see how this works. Um, and again, it kind of spotlights the difference between just regular people on these platforms, you know, uh, just folks who stream as a hobby and then like streamers who become institutions under themselves. Yeah. Because yeah. Those in, they're, they're night and day differences. Like, you know, you're going to see somebody, they, there's nobody who has, who pulls like 20 viewers who could ever open a massive facility. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it also reminds me of like 100 Thieves and Phase Clan, like these like lifestyle brands, right? They mm -hmm. are basically similar, you know, housing a bunch of talent and telling those people to produce um, social media posts. I remember when Phase Clan was going public via um, a, a SPAC. Um, yeah. So, so uh, we got to look at their like financial documents or like their mm -hmm. little pitches to investors and and it was like, oh, look at our giant social media following. Like we have millions and millions, and they're just like, capturing how many impressions they have. And mm -hmm. that was their their big sell to investors and, and why they can go public. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about content creators now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's see. Uh, speaking of content creators, you want to know who the newest creators of content are? Oh. That's right. It's the Saudi government. Oh, my God. <laughs> Man, I wish that reveal had worked better instead of this website not popping up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, anyway, it's the Saudi government. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, no. So a, a Saudi-backed wow. company purchased the ESL, which is a major esports league, right. for $1 billion. Wow. Um, and they also bought the platform to go along with it. That would be the content creation side of things. Mm -hmm. um, face it, for $500 million. Mm -hmm. So the, the Saudi government um, seems quite interested in being involved in video games and in esports specifically, wow. um, yeah, and that is uh, a lot of money, as as many people have pointed out. I mean, we've been you know talking about video game companies getting purchased recently, right. and while this is not quite that amount, it, it's in a similar ballpark. Yeah, yeah, uh, one point five billion in total. That's mm -hmm. that's a lot, um, and it's notable. It's like it's a country. <laughs> yeah. A, wow. Yeah, no. So this is, um, yeah, it's the four hundred billion dollar public investment fund, which is a an extension of the Saudi government, um, was created by the Saudis to help transition the country's economy and position it for a future without oil. Mm -hmm. Um, but, and this is kind of the key thing here, I think, which in certain markets has also been a clear attempt at sports washing the regime's more brutal excesses. Sports washing basically is the idea of you know kind of despotic or otherwise problematic governments. Um, and leaders using sports and sports teams to pave over the bad things and crimes they have done. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, they this, use more than sports, where they use movies and propaganda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's another extension of that, and one that can often be more personable because you can, you know, get attached to a sports team and be like, "I love this team," or like, "I love these players," and then kind of like not think about all of the connections that those people have. Um, this is extremely mm -hmm. common in MMA. Um, mm -hmm. I my favorite circus that is broadly very bad. Um, they there are a lot of very popular fighters who have ties to um, some pretty brutal dictators, especially in like Chechnya. Um, is one of the main ones. Uh, Kadyrov is his name, and he associates with a lot of fighters who are from uh, Dagestan and places like that. Anyway, it's not great. Um, and in the case of the Saudis, especially. Let's see, yeah. Um, beyond its traditional roots and the blah, blah, blah. Um, where is this part of the article? 
where it talks about kind of the yeah so newcastle par- purchase was controversial um yeah ever since the steel was first talked about represented a clear attempt by the saudi authorities to sports wash their appalling human rights record with the glamour of top flight football in the case of buying a football team and so this kind of like follows along similar lines oh. the uh the saudi government has an abysmal track record with lb lgbt rights uh-huh. and um yeah wait that last paragraph though that was really interesting oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah hey uh might be something worth looking into mm, i i think yeah this all all roads lead back to activision blizzard huh? yeah they really do um but yeah so like that is uh yeah, obviously, quite a thing to see them expanding into esports in this way. And yeah, oh, that the other thing that I was going to say specifically is that um, if you want to switch over to our own article about some of this in the past, because Saudi also tried to um, work with Riot on or work mm. in yeah, mm-hmm. work with Riot on the LEC. Right. Uh, but yeah, so in in our article about that, yeah, critics of the partnership between Riot and Neon, for example, pointed to the suppression of the country's LGBTQ plus population and <laughs> Very pertinently, the killing of Washington Post columnist Jamal uh, Khashoggi. Kishak- Kishak- yeah, I don't know how to pronounce his last Kishak- name. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so um, anyway, that's regrettable. Wow. <laughs> what a what a thing to put in the stream. Wow. Yep. Uh, that's, yeah. That's so, that's so rough. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, rule of thumb, when major governments start making inroads into an industry or culture that, you know, is has a public facing presence probably be very skeptical of their um their motives because they're probably bad Mm -hmm. speaking of bad wow i'm on it with the transitions today um (laughs) uh, earlier this week and a clone of popular indie game unpacking was at the top of the app store right oh yeah okay yeah thankfully um but yeah an incredibly shameless clone like i mean look at these screenshots Right. What would you say? Is this from Unpacking, the popular indie game? Yeah. I mean, looking at this, I would think that. Yeah, we just did that on the stream a couple of weeks ago, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, looks exactly the same. And yet, it is a totally different game that somebody who had no connection to the original developers of that game put on the App Store um, and then put a ton of ads across um, TikTok and Instagram and places like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, managed to, through that, just amass a huge number of downloads such that they yeah just yeah. made it to the top of the charts and um so that that blows because They're... even for a relatively successful indie game like unpacking that's still a huge blow yeah there are a lot of um copycat apps i mean that was one big thing in the epic uh, apple trial which is still like mm-hmm. i mean the decision came out but they're still appealing and they're still like ongoing discussions over it but yeah like just the fact that epic was like you're you're trying to gatekeep uh apple store so much but you have all these copy uh cat apps on your platform that's not like you really uh were that careful um and yeah there there are apps like this i i guess um eventually it gets taken down though Mm -hmm. well yeah i mean i i think that apple has in recent years gotten better about taking these things down quickly but even then only in the face of community backlash so I mean, they they did not make any move to take this game down until you know there was a ton of outcry on Twitter and other platforms like that. Mm-hmm. And yeah, as Kotaku points out, this is the second time in recent memory that basically this exact sequence has unfolded. Last time it was Wordle, oh, right. and that was just a couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, it's always the same thing of like instead of Apple doing its own moderation and ensuring that this doesn't happen, they rely on the community to do it. Which is, I'm sure, cheaper, um, but also means that a lot of damage is done in the process. Yeah, it is interesting because they have a very rigorous uh, app uh, like process, like mm-hmm. process to apply for an app. So you would think they would catch that. Uh... You would think. And yet, uh, lastly, I want to point to the because the the publisher of this clone game um, gave a statement, and it's an incredibly funny statement to me. Specifically this part, Um, they say, I'd like to apologize for our lack of research prior to launching the game from one of the developers we work with. So basically they're saying like one of our developers did it, it wasn't us, Um, whatever. But also like your lack of research, like what are you talking about? Whoever made this game for you 
researched the game too well to the point that they copied it. Um, mm. So that's already a weird phrase. And then second, uh, let's just do something really fast here. Um, say games, let's do a little Google search. And then uh, let's look at one of the games they put out very recently, one of their other top games. I wonder if it's on their website or if it's too blatant for them to have here anymore. He has um, another one of their okay. games is okay. just like straight up. Here we go. Say games LLC. No, oh, they removed another one. Wow, that's funny. What, what so as of earlier this week, actually, I can I can find this on my own Twitter. Um, don't mind the indulgence of me doing this really fast. Um, so as of earlier this week, they had several games on the App Store. And another one of them was a blatant copycat. Let's see. Here we go. Say game seems really concerned about respecting the IP of small creators. <laughs> Monsters yeah. Lab. So, um, in any case, funny of them to be like, Ooh, oh, no, we should have done more research. Guess you should have done more research, like, at least two times, if not more. Um, yeah, that implies that they came up with the idea on their own. It's an original idea, but... Um, uh huh. Mm. Yeah, no. I mean, again, seems like they're very into original I ideas. Just, you know, other people's original ideas. Mm. <laughs> um, let's see. In, in happier news about a game succeeding, at least happy, near and dear to my own heart, um, did you know that Yu-Gi-Oh! is super popular again? Oh, really? Well, it's always, it's always, it's a cult favorite. It continues. Yeah, but now it's just a favorite. So <laughs> as of right now, the fourth most popular game on Steam is a Yu-Gi-Oh! game. Wow. Yeah. That's great. Mm hmm Yeah, no. So this is Master Duel, which is like a, I believe, yeah, free-to-play Yu-Gi-Oh! game. Um, and it came out on the 18th, so uh -huh. it's only been out for a little bit more than a week. Oh, and wow, yeah, could be another gameplay stream. Wow. It could be. Oh, man. Oh, that's next week. <laughs> let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Um, okay. But, but, yeah, I mean, this player count is ridiculous. They Their peak player count was over 200,000 today. Mm -hmm. And, like, I mean, again, the only games that touch those numbers are the biggest on all of Steam. Like right, right. Apex, PUBG, yeah, it's so Dota, funny. Yeah, it has more than uh, GTA right now. Yeah. Um, or, it has yeah. the amount of GTA right now. Wow. Yeah. And, like, if you really want to, well, I don't really feel like tracking the, like, stats across the week, but we could. Anyway, it's held pretty steady. Um, That's so, great. Yeah. Good for Yu-Gi-Oh. Yu-Gi-Oh's back, folks. I'm, um, I'm always thinking about like the old games that I left behind and like how they're doing and Neopets and Maple Street not doing so well. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to see you here, um, <laughs> get back to the top of the charts. Yeah, I mean, everybody's like, you know, Logan Paul is like buying and selling Pokemon cards for millions of dollars. So it makes sense that the next step in this progression is that Yu Gi Oh is also back in mm -hmm. a big way. Okay. Maybe Beyblade yeah. and Digimon are next. Huh. <laughs> Man, I hope Digimon or I hope Beyblade comes back. Yeah. I, mean, I was all about Beyblade as a kid. Huh. Yeah, maybe my most like shamefully embarrassing hobby. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was just tops. You just oh, I, mean, I, I think my whole tops at each other it. until one of them exploded. What? I went to nerd school. Everyone was doing that, so I was not oh. shameful at all. So I was like, "What, what do you mean?" <laughs> I I went to a school where like everybody was nerds, but they tried to pretend they weren't. So uh -oh. yeah, yeah. Uh, too bad. Yeah, yeah, real bummer. Oh, well, let's see. Okay. Oh, so it's time for the like final wrap up of just, you know, you know how like at the end, I like to show people dumb things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's time for that. Okay. All right. So first off, we got yet another look at Facebook's version of the metaverse oh, this week. Oh, man. That's great. And <laughs> Not, it is like, deeply oh, upsetting. There's another world. And it's right here. On my face. Oh, my God. Welcome. This Sorry, I forgot about that part and how much I hated it. Alright, really so first off, nobody has legs. They, yeah. they don't have legs. And it looks so bad. She has a mustache. And as as the person who tweeted this out pointed out, they're making it they're trying so hard for it to feel like the good place, the show. Wow. I mean, they, this woman is just like doing a line for line, like 
delivery in the style of uh Kristen uh what's her name the, the, the yeah Kristen Bell okay yeah I I can see it um I'm just like excited for like our tech team's coverage of this because they really like get go in on <laughs> meta and yeah right and I'm excited for that because look at this video. Wow. yeah I mean this is just like like you know Generally, I believe that people should be as cringe as they want to, but this is too cringe. This hurts. And also, to go back to the floating, you're floating too high off the ground. Make them float either closer to the ground it's so that it looks more like they're walking, or make honestly, them fly. You can't be in the middle. It's very scary. It's like all these, I don't know, bodies approaching me like an army. It's uh -huh. frightening. Yeah, I know. It's bizarre. I mean, it just like, I, I feel like this is, uh, yeah. I'm I'm not sure if anybody was like, oh dang, that looks cool. I I feel like basically everyone said like, uh, yeah, no, this ain't it. Maybe it's like their goal is to go to go so cringe that everyone is talking about them. And, yeah, exactly. Uh, kind of worked. Yeah, I mean, it is getting everybody talking about them for sure. Oh yeah, yep, correct. Uh, in chat again, the immediate and. First question is, why does nobody have legs? Uh, truly one to ask Mark Zuckerberg. Why? Maybe... Think, like, you don't need to wear pants. Literally. Well, <laughs> yeah, because you don't have any legs. Yeah, I, I guess that's one selling point, maybe. No, it's just so weird. It's such weird that's what, character. That's design. what she was saying in the, in the ad. She's like, hey, you don't have to wear pants. Anyway. Right. Cool. Yeah. I don't know what to make of it. Anyway. Oh when you're no, watching not. the post gaming, this is our next investigative story. <laughs> <laughs> Why do they not have legs? Horizon Zero le legs. Oh. That's so good. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, now that's the game I'd play. Just uh, bring Hor Horizon Zero Dawn to PC and then mod out the legs. Perfect. It's the ultimate. It's it's Meta's new game. They don't even have to make the metaverse. It already mm -hmm. exists. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah. So for our final kind of a. Uh, I wanted to do a, a final thing this week that's a little bit different because, like, usually I just play a video and I'm like, okay, everybody leave. I don't want to see you anymore. Um, wow. But I mean, it's, I'm just saying how I feel. Um, but this week we had a little uh, the The Rock decided to talk about how he's making another video game movie, and he won't say which one. So I want to know which one do you think it is? What's he working oh. on? Oh, oh my god, that's a hard question. Yeah, I thought. I thought you were gonna ask me to find out, and I would just go like maybe go to like this this uh, special effects companies and like like kind of like you know reverse no, no, engineer it. Go don't to the journalist about this. <laughs> what they're working That's gross. On. I have to actually nobody, guess. Nobody comes to the Washington Post for journalism. <laughs> they come here for baseless speculation oh, about man. what this very large man is doing right now. I don't. I really don't like play these kinds of games whatever uh -huh. game he's in i don't play it so i have to guess based on i mean there's like a home the, call of duty right mm -hmm. <laughs> you get his big beautiful face i don't Maybe know <laughs> oh man yeah Dwayne is Dwayne is cool um yeah i don't know i mean this is like a helicopter like call of duty is my I, mean, I, I think this is just a random like picture from i, I think GameSpot just Picked whatever thing was lying around. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, yeah, you yeah. want me to guess any franchise, not based I just on want you to like of. sort of. Okay. I, I put this here as kind of like a, a, an imagination stimulus. So, like, you see his face and you just imagine him in vast and infinite oh, worlds. Oh, my God. Where did the okay, rock so, go? Oh, it could have been any do? franchise. Oh, but I'm like walked into all the shooters now. Oh, man. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, what, what would be a good franchise for him? Can he be like, can he be Dante? From, from Devil, Devil May Cry. Cry. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so you just put him in like a little white wig. Yeah. <laughs> and then he's like, because Dante is like kind of, you know, like thin. And like, so then you have The Rock like just busting out of like his yeah. red jacket yeah. and stuff. <laughs> and you just fit him at all. And he then in this sense. like. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then in this movie, nobody acknowledges any of this. Everyone just treats him like he's normal Dante. They're like, mm -hmm. hey, Dante, <laughs> good to see you. And hey, is that a new jacket? Fits you great, bud. Looking yeah. amazing. Like a hundred yeah, bucks. Then, yeah, no, and his brother is like cast perfectly instead. And then he's like, <laughs> exactly. why does he look so different? Nobody acknowledges why. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, like Virgil's just cast like, you know, some pretty anime boy who looks just like him. And yeah. or looks just like the games or game character. Yeah, it could be yeah. Timothy Chalamet as his brother anyway. Oh my God. 
Oh my God, it's amazing. <laughs> yes, we figured oh. it out. Wow. The, you heard it here first, um, simply because it's such a good idea. The Rock in Devil May Cry the movie, FT, his best friend, Timothy Chalamet. Um, oh. Folks in chat are saying a Doom remake. He already did Doom. He can't do Doom again. That'd be ridiculous. Oh. Um, Fortnite. I mean, at this point, like he's already been in Fortnite the game. So maybe, but eh, I, I don't know about that. Um, I think that Fortnite will be just like, if they make a movie of it, it'll be Ready Player One again. It'll just be every series altogether. Hmm. Um, let's see. Yeah, he was in Spy Hunter, Doom, Jumanji, Rampage. Oh, That's four video game movies. Three that actually came out. Yeah, because Spy Hunter was canceled. But the game of it came out. That was the weird thing. The The game based on the movie that never came out did come out. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Um, but anyway, it's going to be Double May Cry. Yeah, I mean, you heard yeah. it here first. Or All maybe, right. like, maybe Metal Gear with the same basic concept of The Rock just being massively bigger than everyone. Yeah, what was your guess? Like, you have to say yeah. your guess, and then we have to find yeah. out who was right after a couple months. I mean, I, I'm so taken by your guess. <laughs> I I just think that yours must be correct. Like, <laughs> Thanks. I, it's just too perfect. I, I can see it in my mind's eye. I can right. see every major scene from the Devil May Cry series playing yeah. out. Just That's with, what I'm like, saying. Yeah. The, the rock modded in. <laughs> <laughs> he, he just augments the movie and makes it better. I, yeah, exactly. exactly. So. Um, no, let's see. What would he... Okay, so I think a very funny one would be, like... And, and this is not actually something... Oh, yeah, it could be Gears of War. Oh, yeah, um, that's also another thought I had, but I didn't yeah. want to say it. Because, like, that's, like, really... Yeah, I would guess that for everything. But <laughs> Okay, so here's what I do with that. Um, if it was Gears, again, following my kind of, like, way that this needs to unfold, The Rock would still need to be bigger than everyone. So it'd be a bunch of, like, it would be The Rock being the biggest of all, and then a bunch of either, like, either strangely small dudes or, like, guys that are ripped, but just not The Rock size ripped. Oh my God. You would just have to stand out as the biggest boy. Hmm. Um, so yeah. there's that. Or my idea is that they would make... So, you know how there's, like how Vin Diesel has like the Riddick series and that's like his baby. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the rock and Vin Diesel are like in a perpetual feud. They hate each other. This is a real life thing. That's why the rock isn't in any more fast movies. Oh. And so the, the Chronicles of Riddick escape from butcher Bay is a legitimately great video game. And so I think it'd be incredibly funny to make a movie based on that game where the rock plays Riddick. <laughs> because then Vin Diesel would be so I don't think it could happen but if it did happen Vin Diesel would be so mad mm, okay yeah. so you're thinking maybe The Rock can be spiteful yeah exactly and maybe like he makes a rip off of Escape from Butcher Bay okay. and he calls it like you know Escape from Slasher Village or something wow <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh, who's the real copycat now exactly oh. I mean um but yeah, I guess that's my guess. Do I have any other guesses? What if I just like look at my Steam library and the first thing that comes to mind oh is, what he, <laughs> is what he'll be How in? Many guesses? I think you should only get one guess oh. and you used it up. Oh, man. He could do God of War. Oh. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. He could definitely do God of War. Uh-huh. Yeah, right? I mean, that could work pretty well. Um, I mean, I, I don't know how capable he is of growing. No, he can grow a beard. I can, I can see some stubble there. He can probably grow a beard if he really wants to. Um, yeah. let's see what other, what other games would be really good if the rock was just part of them. Um, oh, near near would be great with the rock in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Borderlands, but I, there's already the board borderlands already fully cast. That'll be out pretty soon. Um, Final fantasy seven. Oh, yes. The Rock and just a yellow wig. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, Among Us. Everyone oh. else looks like a regular, like, you know, like a regular character in Among Us. And then, like, The Rock is just, like, again, I mean, busting through his costume. And everyone's like, yeah, but who's the imposter? There's I no mean, way to know. At this point, you're just uh, you're talking about skins, right? And then, yeah, he could be in any any game with any skin. And I mean, no, I'm talking movies. The These all have extreme cinematic potential <laughs> yeah wow. oh man half-life but the okay. rock okay i i think yeah that's 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 enough guesses <laughs> mm, i don't know i think we could go all day yakuza there we go that's final answer the the rock okay, actually the rock is the rock i think yakuza. i think yakuza is the, the right answer actually. the rock 
No, oh my god. And also, like, it could be like Yakuza Kiwami Zero. Like, it could be like that guy that, like, uh-huh. is on the wall and he's like, You can't see me. And, like, it's the first quest, one of the first quests in the game where, uh-huh. like, the, like, he's like a criminal and he's like hiding on the wall. But uh-huh. he's so obvious. He's like, I, You just can't see me. And you have to, like, go and click on him. And so it would be The Rock walking up to him and being like, Hey, man. I can't <laughs> see you. Nice. Perfect. All right. <laughs> that's The Rakuza. We've done it. And with that, I think we conclude yet another intensely, dangerously, harrowing, harrowingly successful um, episode of our weekly show. Yeah. Maybe one of the best ever because we came up with the Rakuza. And I'll just keep saying that over and over and over <sighs> for the rest of my life. I was trying to pretend that I didn't hear that. And now it's getting harder. Yep. <laughs> mm. You might even have to acknowledge it someday. Mm, I don't think so. Okay. Well, I guess that's fair. Anyway, um, so as I think most of the people probably still watching know, we do the show every Thursday, 4 p.m. ET. Um, We'll be back next week doing the same thing with a different subject and all that. Um, In addition, we have another stream tomorrow, gameplay. Um, We're going to be playing Pokemon Arceus Legends. That will also be at 4 p.m. And um, yeah, I think that's pretty much everything. Maybe Yu-Gi-Oh! soon. Maybe oh, yeah. Legends, yes. but you can. Yeah. If Yu-Gi-Oh! continues to be massively popular, then I would love to play that on stream next week. We'll see if we can make that happen. But yeah, in the meantime, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I have been and hopefully will remain Nathan Grayson. And uh, <laughs> Shannon, are you going to transform into anybody different in the near future? Uh, are you going to stay um, the same? Yeah, I'll, I'll leave that as like an open question. You can like have some suspense. Tune in next time to find out. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and that... uh. In the other square next to us, that's uh, our co-host, Rock the Dwayne Johnson. Um, he's, of course, been wonderful as he is every week. Uh, say goodbye, Rock the Dwayne. He says, hey, man, bye. <laughs> yep, that was The Rock. All right. Later, everyone.